Coming to you at your leisure from Flatbush, Brooklyn, this is Nothing is Boring. On this show, we talk to experts, wonks, and specialists of all kinds, try to get them going, talking the way they talk when no normal people are around. We're going for max time spent in the weeds, pretty much focusing on the part of the conversation that normally comes after, I don't want to bore you. This is the second episode. If you missed the first one, please check it out. We talked to a food scientist named Cody Masters. It's fascinating. Our website is hardwork.party slash nothing is boring. There you can find links to subscribe on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Play, uh, or you can just listen to the show right there. You can also find at that website, hardwork.party slash nothing is boring. You can find uh, images from the show. There's a whole bunch of imagery that accompanies this interview uh, that I suggest you check out because it's pretty awesome. It showcases my guest's work and a studio visits my guest's shop, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, you can reach us at Hard Work Party on Instagram and Twitter. Our Facebook page is Nothing Is Boring. It's pretty easy to reach. So you got Nothing Is Boring, you got Hard Work Party. Is it confusing? Yeah, it probably is. Am I going to change it? Too late. Thank you for listening. Really appreciate it. If you like the show, please tell a friend. Please subscribe on iTunes. Please rate us five stars. And if you really feel motivated, leave us a review on iTunes because that helps too because people read the reviews. You know, my mom left a review. You know, would it, would it kill you? Would it kill you? My mom did it. This episode was really fun. I talked to my good friend, makeup artist, Adam Bailey, who's also a Southern gentleman, as you'll find out pretty quickly in the interview. Adam works on makeup and effects for film, TV, stage, music videos, things like that. He's made severed heads with embedded cameras in them, stigmata wounds, silicone boobs, all kinds of injuries, stuff like that. We talk about all kinds of stuff, bald caps, uh, empathy, claustrophobia, uh, gore. My dogs make an appearance in this show. We talk about squibs, scars, teeth, gelatin, foam latex, uh, release agents, Herman Munster. It all comes up. I hope you like this. Adam's a real genial guy. Uh, he's got a real fun uh, approach to what is already a fun industry. And I learned a ton simply about latex, just in that narrow category. Boy, did I learn a lot. And as you'll see, if you visit the blog, uh, I, I visited uh, Adam's studio after we did this interview and he made a cast of my head. So there's some great imagery from that. Uh, I found out that I'm not claustrophobic. And then I make a nice uh, a nice head mold. And Adam makes a nice head mold. We work well together. So go to the blog, check those images out. Please reach out to us. Uh, let us know what you think. Stick around after the show for a little extra something something and enjoy this. Adam Bailey, I love you. All of you, including Adam Smooches. You're, you're basically, you're a makeup artist, but you're basically, from what I can tell from the outside, you're a sculptor. Yeah. I mean, that's really what I kind of enjoy more. Um, but I kind of, you when, know, it just, it was like another aspect of sculpture. Kind when you of. say that's what you enjoy more, you mean you enjoy sculpture more well, than I makeup? Enjoy, I enjoy fabricating stuff more and the problem solving that comes along with that. Okay. And being in my studio and not being on set for you know, ridiculous amounts of hours eating, you know, minimally acceptable food, regardless of how big the production company is. Right. I mean, I swear, I think the time I worked with Mark and Dave on the wizard thing, it's probably the best set food I've ever had, you know? And so I just, I can't, it's, yeah. So I don't really enjoy the onset aspect. Um, I'm, I'm going to now never get called again when this podcast airs. How much, how much of what you do is on set? I mean, um... 
I guess it, it's from project to project. But, you know, right now, for instance, I work on a couple of TV shows and I don't really, at this point, I don't design and fabricate a lot of stuff for the amount of onset time I'm there. It's usually stuff that's out of kit, meaning a black eye or something that I can make out of my kit instead of having to make a mold, make a sculpture, make another mold, cast, you know, that's the whole process. Right. And that's, you're yeah. saying that's the part of the business that you're more interested in? That is the more, yeah. The and stuff those are probably the bigger pieces, right? Like that's the bigger jobs, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, when anytime that I'm, I'm in the studio mate fabricating something, that's when it starts to get expensive for productions. Right. And I mean, it depends on who. Some people like Gotham, like I work on this TV show, Gotham, they have a lot of money, but they definitely like to, to, to pinch every penny. Right. Uh, nickel and dime you and That's stuff. That's how you but, get rich. Exactly. <laughs> God, if I could only learn yeah. that. No, it's, yeah, it's a, the whole spend money to make money thing is a total lie. Yeah. It's propagated by the, <laughs> by the poor. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, and that makes sense. I mean, it kind of sounds like the analogy would be like for an architect, like they love building. I mean, this isn't true for all architects, but I'm mm-hmm. sure for a lot of architects, they would love building a new building if they could every time. But a lot of their business is renovation mm-hmm. um, or like retrofit or something like that. Yeah. Um, so it sounds to me like you're more interested in the in the design fabrication. Interesting. Yeah. So did, have you ever worked in other sculptural media like um, stone? No, I haven't yet. Like, oh God, I would love to though. I mean, that's, you know, every sculpture doesn't really consider themselves, you know, worth their salt unless they can do that kind of sculpting. I mean, I don't. I know a lot of my favorite sculptors are like, yeah, I mean, I can design and sculpt a cool monster, but oh my God. I mean, look at, you know, this um, Carpo or this, you know, there's just uh, the old classical sculptors. I mean, there was no adding there was no mold making it was just one chance yeah and a lot of planning a lot of forethought and i don't know if i really want to 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 go in that realm but i have a a higher respect for it than i do most sculptors you know like doing what they're doing today because it's, you're talking about like welding two i-beams at a exactly. 15 degree angle exactly <laughs> standing it well, in the ground i know that's public art <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah I'm not, i've never tried it I, i've always wanted to but it's a whole different it's like working with wood and then deciding you would like to work with metal, it's a whole different set of tools. It's yeah. a whole, you know, bunch more practice. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I have a, it's like a whole different realm that I would love to. Carving mm-hmm, mm-hmm. out of stone, mm-hmm. subtractive process, mm-hmm. um, which with, as, as you said, like no additive element to it. Additive sculpture, like what you might consider additive, might be like working with something soft like clay or something, right? Yeah, foam or wax. Or wood. Okay. Yeah. You are doing a lot of work with casting, but casting requires uh, a positive first, right? So, what is that made out of? Let's say you're making a mask, mm-hmm. you're going to do a, a whole head cast first, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, what's that process like? Uh, Wow, for me it's pretty it's pretty anxiety ridden. Really? Yeah, because I'm really claustrophobic myself, ah. and so anytime I'm making a mold, even if it's like just of a nose or something, yeah. I'm like, you know, you get empathy like, claustrophobia. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, and most people just I would say more than half the people will fall asleep during the process. Really? Which I'm like, God, I don't know how they. This do This guy that, would man. love it. This dog that I have in my lap right now, <laughs> one of my dogs, Poncho, loves to have his his eyes covered oh my god so you'll see in a minute he'll probably stick his face in my armpit and he just he wants to (laughs) he just buries his face that's all he wants but okay so you feel Mm. um anxiety on behalf of your your subjects when you're when you're casting their heads because so but for people that don't know like how does this how does this work you well generally put a bucket over their head you have a new handstand exactly you don't just hot hold your plastic yeah Pretty much. That's it. Um, no, it's, it's you know, putting, generally it's putting something around. So if I'm doing a head and shoulders, which is generally the bigger kinds of sculptures that I, or the bigger um, life casts that I will make. Because the mask has to go under the shirt, right? So it's. Yeah. Well, I mean, essentially, you know, I have to. wearing a V-neck in all of your productions. <laughs> Only V-neck. It's in your rider. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh 
you know, it depends on how big the prosthetic is. But let's say, for instance, if I'm going to do a whole head, shoulder encompassing thing, then yes, I will have to prep somebody's skin, clean it, put a bald cap on them. Which to can, shave their it depends. chest? Exactly. How much chest shaving do you do? <laughs> I have done more of than I would like to admit. Mm-hmm. And it's now it's just it's a rote thing that I will do. It's just like, okay, it's time to shave you now. Yeah. It's just and I'm just shaving some, yeah. you know, hairy yeah. German lady. And it's just like <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I thought. And you were the next say. thing I, <laughs> So we, you do you do a ball cap bald cap. hmm I'll do a bald cap. Sometimes that you know, it doesn't have to be as screen ready but it can take 15 20 minutes the bald cap and then if there is any hair like eyebrows eyelashes that i can't shave um then um then yeah i'll put some release agent on it um what is that a release it's just like a a wax based type of like vaseline or something that just sort of is it vaseline and you call it release agent exactly it sounds so much more official. It's not. It sounds There's like a, the- a rub and dug thing to me, <laughs> it's actually. It's a little bit. Let's be honest. <laughs> it's Vaseline. Release agent in there. Yeah, okay. It's off-brand Vaseline I at see. that. That's right. Petroleum but you can, jelly. you charge a lot Let's more for it. get in there. It. Yeah. And the, it's a uh, line item on your, on your but, budget. Uh, I'm going to need $45 for a release agent. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's it. Put a bald cap on somebody or a swim cap if the you know budget doesn't allow because... You know, bald caps themselves aren't cheap, but do you have um, to throw that out after you use it? Yeah, it's you a do. one time. It's a one no time. No kidding. Use. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I will keep it. I don't want people to necessarily know this, but whatever. I'm I'm about full disclosure You're here. I'll keep them. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll keep I'll keep the parts that don't have glue on it, which is to say the hairline yeah. where I glue it. Uh, like the the whole part rest, you know, and you can use this this uh, vinyl essentially to make eyebrow covers if you're going to make All somebody, right. you know, or. That's- but there's We're all using, sorts man. of use and uses for it, and I, I am definitely somebody who likes to create like minimum waste. You because, should be proud of that. What do you mean you don't want people to know that? Well, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's just like I'm sure some actors are gonna be like, wait a second, he put uh, yeah, he put a used <laughs> ball. Smells <laughs> like John Travolta. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. But then then I'll generally do somebody's ears first to give them the sensation of what it's like to be, you know mummified alive essentially but in a, in a slow in a slow burn sort of way and then uh and then i'll do everything and i'll save the face for last that means i mix up this this generally it's a two-part um rubber uh-huh. that's skin safe and that has a, a hair release already in it it's a lot of full release in it's what a lot you do. of a lot of release a lot of lube <laughs> And a lot of release. release. It's it's integral to the craft. Okay. Because I have done more than my fair share of life casts where I have not properly oh. released my subject. As a matter of fact, I won't name any names, but it just happened again recently. Really? Because I was working with somebody who wasn't as familiar with the the process, and we sort of just jumped into it because the actor was really late. And... Um, and we were kind of flustered, and the guy that was helping me kind of mixed one, and we, we put it on, and I was like, wait, we should have put that on second. And so the poor actor, when we were removing it, I mean, it was essentially a waxing. Alopecia, I mean, let's just yeah. let's call it yeah. what it is. I mean, wow. luckily they got to keep some of their eyebrows and wow. eyelashes. <laughs> and, then, and then you got, but, but that's that's like a job security thing, because then you yeah. have to do their eyebrows every day. Exactly. As well, you got to put See, the eyebrows back it's on. not without its design, let's yeah, be you, honest. It may not have been entirely a mistake. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah. So then uh, you always see people with the straws in their nose. That's a thing, right? Yeah. No, we, we don't. You don't do that. You don't, you don't really need to do that anymore. Really? No. What do you mean anymore? Well, because essentially you never are going to life cast somebody laying down because of the potential of um, unless it's like someone that's laying down in a pose and you need that sort of subtle gravity. Mm-hmm. And in which case you could use straws but generally the nose and mouth is its own separate let's just call it batch of material really and so you really want to take care and make sure that that you go around it but if you think about it if you're sitting straight up as one normally would to get a life cast made of them you know the the material is not going to go gravity Uh, is not going to go up your nose okay you know however there are times when the material will sort of occlude the the nostril and and but you ha- there's a lot of reassurance in this time okay i'm gonna i'm, I'm can you breathe okay that, yeah. there's you know so. right here with you it's like yeah, the abyss exactly. we all did this for nine months <laughs> yeah flatliners or something like uh-huh. that you know you're gonna be dead for a little while but uh, um, i'm gonna bring you back wow good reference man i forgot about that 
<laughs> um, so, you, you, but you're, you're, you're painting it on, you pour it over their head. Essentially. Yeah. I'm just sort of smearing it. I mean, it's a really hard to control, hard to manipulate goop. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Um, Is it exothermic? Uh, does it get hot? The part of it does. So yes, I think that's the, why it's basically it rubber. Yeah. And then over that rubber that sets in about five minutes, several batches of rubber, then I will do a, a shell because the rubber itself isn't, you know, it's too flimsy to hold its shape mm -hmm. to pour material in after right. you're done. So then you have to make a plaster bandage, generally, a uh, two-part jacket. And that gets hot. And that gets warm. And I will make sure and let the, the subject aka victim know that it's gonna there is an exothermic yeah you know it, you'll feel it warming up it gets heavy That's as normal. well yeah so it's 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 a sincere sensation i mean i like i said every time i do it i'm just like that you know a hair away from hyperventilating how many times have you been cast yourself <laughs> um let's see here it's been a few years since i've had a mold made of myself and i need a new one how many but, do you have you ever done your own no, you, that would be really, really hard. That'd be cool. It'd be, it'd be like a Marina Abramovic thing. You could do I know. it live. I've thought in, of this. In a studio. I know. Or in I, a gallery. I, <laughs> you know? That would be great. Right? I've, I've thought of it before. I wanted to just sort of do a test run on myself. Yeah. And with a, in front of a mirror and do as much as I could. Mm -hmm. And then essentially a lot of it would be blind as yeah. well. But I think it would be uh, interesting. I haven't done it on myself. We were talking about cloning. You could go with some <clears throat> kind of cloning theme. Right. You know? I think it would be awesome. Me Factory. There you go. I just named your your gallery show. Yes. Yes. You, you don't leave until you've made 99 <laughs> more of yourself. That's, <clears throat> yeah, that's something. That's something to bite into. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, I haven't really done any of myself. It's pretty, I mean, unless it's maybe my hand, but then you've got to do everything with one hand. Yeah. Or, no, I mean, even if I do something for... You know, like a, a normally budgeted project. If I'm doing somebody's head and shoulders, I would I have to have at least two people, if not three. Wow. I mean, two total. So one other person helping me, and if, not counting the guy you're casting. Not counting, yeah, because that, that, that would no that yeah that'd be very hard, very difficult. But uh, yeah, usually because it just needs to go as quick as possible. I've live casted plenty of people, including my girlfriend. Fairly recently, uh, all by myself, head and shoulders, and that means that there she was under for a, lot a good. Of patience. 45 she must love you minutes yeah. oh she she, she, she loves your masks exactly <laughs> loves the free masks that's what she's in it for you mentioned that the the methods have changed over over 20 years and yeah. I know you've been at this for a while, mm. but like on, on an ongoing basis, are you reading trade publications? Oh yeah. 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 You, do a you lot. like go to conventions, the monster mash? Like what is that? And monster mash. <laughs> yes, indeed. Monster Palooza actually is a big one. Is It's true though. <laughs> is it's that true? true? It's true. Oh man. I, it looks really great. I've never been to one there. Ah. They've been going on for several years now, but you know, that's a write off. You get schedule C. I know. C. I do yeah. write off other conventions I that I I bet you do. <laughs> oh, trust me. I bet well, you. I, don't I can any, picture I can't even the write full them release off so convention. <laughs> <laughs> well, anymore, like, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of conventions just because of the crowds and, you yeah. know, um, it's a little overwhelming for me. But right. I do go to typically one called IMATS, which stands for International Makeup Artist Trade Show. Uh -huh. um, and that's kind of the standard bearer as far as makeup effects goes and they have those over six or so cities all over the world including wow. los angeles and new york it yeah. originated in los angeles in the late 90s and I actually went to the very first ones before i took this like several year hiatus from makeup and sculpting in general but those those are definitely the things to go to to find out what's the latest material and um techniques and everything like that right um what yeah. is what has changed uh, you had mentioned that stuff has changed over time. Silicone sounds like it's a new, mm -hmm. or there's new forms of silicone, stuff like that. Like mm -hmm. what, what kind of really significant shit has happened uh, during the time that you've been doing it? During the time that I've been doing it, I would say silicone has been, has, has eclipsed the old materials. Um, basically prosthetics came around like in the fifties and sixties developed by a guy who I was lucky enough to become 
mentored by or I was a student of his. So I never he has a correspondence course, Dick Smith. Dick Smith, right. Dick Smith, who is like, yeah, who is like to make up what, you know, Brando is to acting or something. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, he's just the guy who ultimately pioneered techniques that are still used today. Right. As well as um <clears throat> Uh, I mean, from mold making to, to prosthetics. But yeah, I mean, when prosthetics started off, you know, I don't remember what exactly they were using other than like colloidian and latex. What's colloidian? Colloidian is like, um, it's a kind of plastic in a, uh, some sort of a solvent. I'm not sure what it is, but to do, you, you, if you put it on your skin in several layers, it dries really quick because of the whatever stinky solvents in there. And then it, it constricts and so it's the best way to make a, a a scar that is not an additive scar so it actually looks like mm, you're taking it's away kind of puckered yeah it's yeah. sort of one of the old older uh, tricks but like you know Karloff's Frankenstein for instance was a makeup that uh, Jack Pierce built up every day like there was he didn't make molds or anything of this oh. stuff he, he like Karloff was in the the makeup chair for eight to ten hours ungodly how is that time. sustainable that's crazy i don't know i mean it's just it's amazing especially the level that it holds up to this day as a makeup and it's just great how about herman monster how do you feel about that i i, I like it all i mean i don't i don't think that's one that's that's was like uh in super inspiring but you know i love the monsters <laughs> growing up come on um but yeah it started off with foam latex and then sort of gelatin you know i think probably at the same time gelatin and foam latex in the 50s and 60s and it was pretty standard up and until those are to make prosthetics yes make, exactly okay, those right. are two common materials that are used to make prosthetics right foam latex um being the nicest thing at the time up until the 90s when when platinum silicone platinum when, platinum there's there's generally is that a grade di- it's not it actually I, you know a what? Platinum in it? I would be i would not be the best maybe to describe how platinum and tin I'm saying that wrong because I'm a redneck. Tin, tin, (laughs) T-I-N. Thank you. Tin Tin versus platinum. Okay. Yes. So those are the two types of silicone there are usually. And Mm. tin cure is not something that's generally, I don't, uh, it's not generally skin safe. It sounds toxic. It sounds nasty. How much of what you work with is toxic? A a fair amount. Yeah. Do you wear a respirator a lot? Absolutely. You do? Yeah. Yeah. And I require anybody that works in my space, whether they want to or not, to wear a respirator. And a lot of times I'll buy somebody a really nice respirator. Right. Um, just so I can, uh, Feel. you know, have that peace of mind. Sure. And a lot of guys who do what I do to this day are way more macho mm. about, you know, I don't need it. It's That's fine. probably kind of an accelerating thing as oh your brain God. cells die off and you're just like, yeah. I can't be touched. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm invincible. I've been drinking this shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah. tin, the tin stuff is probably not so skin safe. Right, right. So is that the predecessor to platinum, or tin, is that just tin if you're is more of like a mold indie making. production? Well, non-union. I mean, there are exactly <laughs> non-union, non-sag. Right. Uh, but tin cure, it's some people do use it for prosthetics if it's properly encapsulated uh, uh-huh. with something. Uh-huh. And there's there's some people that really <laughs> use it to amazing effect, but. The standard is this platinum silicone, which was developed in the 90s for the medical industry. And back when it came out... Like the, breast implants? Um, no, that's more... That would be more like a gel material, mm-hmm. like hydrogels or saline or something like that. No, mm. this is more like maxillofacial stuff, which is like people who have war injuries or deformities. Yeah. That would be the silicone like thing that snaps what? into their their face which is you know what i was originally wanting to do uh oh I, right okay yeah, when i was sort of diverted by you you spent a year in med school yeah. studying reconstructive surgery well right? i mean yeah. i don't know if you could really call pre-med pre-med i was in pre-med but um, pre-reconstructive surgery pre-reconstructive, medical <laughs> yeah yeah i didn't get just too a, far just kind of an amateur uh Absolutely. surgery yeah. uh, uh surgeon just doing like hobby surgeries <laughs> minor exactly. facial procedures yeah you know yeah on, on people's pets yeah and exactly stuff. but uh and so when you when you worked with dick smith mm-mm. uh dick smith famous for winning studied, an oscar for studied with uh amadeus yes study with him okay yep, yep uh he did scanners he did yes. that scene famously has a exploding head gag yeah actually wait was that him no spoilers uh, according to his imdb okay it was, it was okay. i don't know that wow, he did that gag that. we'll cut this out uh <laughs> but uh <laughs> 
that uh, did any of those did any of that stuff come up? That when he, when he, when he's lecturing, does he say like when I was working on? Uh, he does. Um, the thing is, uh, so basically, what he offered and still offers, though he um, other people are carrying it on for him because he died a few years ago at the ripe age of ninety two. I think. Wow, Hollywood um, guys, man. I know, right? So they live the fast of, and die old. And amazing. the fact that he had like his lab in his basement for years. I mean, yeah. you know, he's uh, he used to be on the East Coast, uh, so he was one of the rare guys that huh. like managed to make such a big impact and was not out west. Right. But, um, I mean, he made the biggest impact. There will never be anybody, you know. I mean, there's Rick Baker. Rick was Dick's protege, you know, and Rick went on to do stuff like Thriller, American Werewolf, and I want to get to that land of stuff. Yes, exactly. I want to talk about um, that? But no, for instance, Dick. It was it's a correspondence course that he offers. Uh huh. So you basically contacted him, right. as I did in the mid '90s, out of the back of a comic book or something. No, how did I know about it? That's that's not far off. I'm not sure. What, oh, you know what it was is. He had one of the very first and only at the time um, do-it-yourself makeup at home books that I found Sweet. in a magic shop man. in Knoxville, Tennessee. That is a double whammy of awesome. Oh man, it was like when I found that, I was just like it was my Bible, like yeah. immediately. There's like a shaft of sunlight oh, in a yes, windowless was, room, just like was on it. the book in the corner. That You're like, it. what's that? And I think oh I, that old thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I found out about. I can't even remember how I found out about it originally. I just studied on my own the three or four books that were out at the time. Yeah. on this craft in the early 90s and and um and yeah so i just i found out about his course i contacted him and he was famous for being so approachable right i mean anybody could ask him anything and he would spend a lot of time on the phone with you um so it was all via telephone that's calls. incredible oh, it was crazy i mean i would he would just tell me stories about the exorcist and the godfather oh he works on the exorcist oh yeah he did the exorcist godfather amadeus yeah the the yeah um the big stuff the big stuff a lot and, of projectile vomit in the exorcist uh, uh what was an altered states he did oh wow the hunger the hunger some of the best i don't know that one. my favorite what's the hunger the hunger is the david bowie vampire movie I didn't even know about oh, this. Oh, yeah, with Catherine Deneuve and the, like, with Bauhaus soundtrack. Just wow. a great, I can't remember the director. It's an excellent movie that still holds up. I mean, it's kind of dated, but the makeups are, he did Little Big Man, Dustin Hoffman, the super old, no. I don't know that one either. It's kind of like a, a holy grail makeup also for yeah? art makeup artists because it was the first, one of the first makeups that he broke down a whole age makeup into separate pieces for ease of application and for shrinkage of materials anyway but interesting but yeah i would call him and if i had a problem or if i had a new piece that i wanted to submit for you know you had to do certain pieces in order to get your certificate from him hmm. and so i would you know i would submit this he would give me critique i would fix how was he it. reviewing you're sending photos and stuff sending and this photos. is pre-internet oh yeah pre-internet man i would send photos and he would give me some critique and i would rework it and uh yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, so lucky. Yeah. Is there is there a difference to you or is there a generally agreed upon difference or a distinction between um, effects and makeup? Yeah. Yeah, pretty big difference. I mean, you mean like like straight makeup, like beauty makeup versus effects makeup? Well, I, I guess, so you consider yourself a makeup artist, right? Yeah. And... Uh, do you draw a line? Is it important to draw a line mm. or does it not matter mm. uh, between what's considered to be makeup work and effects work? I mean, I'm sure yeah. like on a larger set in a, in a union context or mm -hmm. in a context where credits yeah. are, are relevant, mm -hmm. uh, that this is becomes important. Like where does that line get drawn conventionally? Like, let's say I have a gag like the scanner's gag, mm -hmm. you know? And like, this is, again, spoiler alert, but a man's head explodes. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that is entirely, uh, uh, well, it's, his head didn't really explode. So right. I'm pretty sure that that was a match cut, but it, it at a certain point, there is a, a life cast of this guy's head yeah, yeah. that's full of watermelon or something. And it's a makeup effects guy, yeah, that usually will do something like that. I mean, typically the way that the... Okay, you just said makeup effects, though. This kind of muddies the waters a little bit. Special special effects, makeup, makeup effects. We can't, to this day, decide on like the, the thing to call it prosthetic makeup or... But yeah, um, typically the way it breaks down is there's a, a makeup department on any project and there's a department head. And usually, usually there's a key as well, like a key 
makeup department. Best person. boy makeup. Exactly. Best, Best boy. Let's, yeah. let's call it what it is. Here. Yeah. Um, but those people typically are more straight makeup people, meaning that they could do effects. They generally have a, a, a working knowledge of it. Right. But anytime that there is something that needs to be uh, like built up, you know, like a prosthetic that can really be continuity matched. Um, that's usually when they'll call somebody like me and be like, Hey, I have these days where this effect plays. Can you, you know, work? Uh, can you bring a prosthetic? Can you life cast this actor and, and take care of this while I manage the department and all the other makeups? So there are a few people that head departments that are able to build stuff themselves. But generally, I mean, it's just not really practical for them to be running a department as well. So generally, those people are more straight makeup effects people. And they bring in people like me on a case-to-case basis as needed for prosthetics. So you're deployed as a makeup specialist as part of an effect gag. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. But, okay, so, I mean, again, this is kind of inside baseball because... For people who consume uh, uh, Hollywood products, I mean, I'm using Hollywood as a shorthand for like the film and, and TV industry, but like for people who consume the product of these industries, they don't really realize how important turf is uh, to the kind of organization of these things, how important um, credits are, how important uh, budgets are, and what silos things fall under. Um, and the fact that even like fist fights break out between uh, specialists over like whose work is is one job, uh, which is why I'm kind of interested to know like, you know, is there as a career thing is there a difficulty presented by not staying neatly in one compartment? Like, let's say you really want to get into like squibs or something like that. Is that something that falls under a completely different? Squibs do, yeah. Squibs are not generally makeup effects people. It's more pyro. Yeah, because it's a whole different... I mean, I would love to be able to do that, and Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to. Um, But the extent to that kind of effect that that a makeup effects guy would be in charge of would be, for instance, a bleeding prosthetic. But anytime there's some sort of explosion... That would definitely, like a squib, like which, which, you know, immediately, as soon as I started to get into makeup effects, I wanted to be able, oh, I want to do the, you know, yeah. you know the, the Godfather scene where he gets shot a minute, you know, I just, right, right. I wanted to try it, though I was never much into gore. Um, no, that would generally be a pyro guy. Interesting. Yeah. But if you were doing a bleeding effect. But now, like, for instance, like a, uh, like a, anything where there's a blast of blood, for instance, like a, um, that would be a makeup effects guy because that would be like a, an air powered type of effect holy shit so the the (laughs) presence of combustibles is where they absolutely okay so that's very interesting yeah yeah yeah. so pneumatics are okay Mm -hmm. and can stay under the makeup silo Mm -hmm. but you get into effects or pyro when you start working with things that combust on an actor on an actor now if there's an animatronic and you want it to explode or a or a dummy with a head you know that that there's no contact, there's yep. no chance of of injury, right? Then yeah, that would be an, a generally a makeup effects guy. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that scanner's gag might have been under the makeup department. Makeup uh, effects. Yes, most likely it was. Interesting. I'm not sure exactly. There's a cool little thing. I don't remember where I saw. It was like a yeah. YouTube video, probably made from a mini doc or something, where they uh-huh. discussed like how they were going to pull that off. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, now I'm. I'm blanking on what ended up going down. It was basically like they called an audible and they did that by hand. It was something like either a guy like shot him with a rifle. Oh yeah. It was with a, that's right. I think I recently saw that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. They like shot him with a shotgun, like yeah. with a slug from yeah. a, like some ridiculous. He just blew his head off. Yeah. 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 Something you can never trip. get away with now. So gore and horror are, are a real big part of your business. Yeah. Do you think that uh, the people that do what you do get into it because of that? Or is that just a component of it? Like you're, it's interesting to hear you say you're not that into the gore and horror element mm-hmm. of it. But mm-hmm. if you look at your uh, repertoire and you you look at any makeup artist's output, like yeah. there's a ton of gore and horror. Yeah. Uh, obviously, that's that's um, a place where makeup effects are needed, mm-hmm. and because violence is is portrayed so often in film and TV, and mm-hmm. there's no other way to get it done unless it's digital, which I'd like to talk about. But yeah. you so. How do you how do you uh, how do you learn about that stuff? How do you gather reference for that stuff? As someone who's not like constantly on 
the internet, like looking at pictures of people being hit by trains or whatever it is, you know, I'm sure there are people that are like that. Like, how do you, how do you approach that as a material? Well, I would say, first of all, that there are people who will make a whole career as a special effects makeup artist doing nothing but gore and loving life to do that. Right. And that's great because they're probably never going to be short on work. Right. Um, Well, I don't know. That's a bit of a generalization, but there, you know... I'm not a fan of it so much um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I can't watch that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I can't. I mean, I just never have been able to without, you know, nearly passing out or vomiting. It's it's sort of an irony that I get made fun of a lot by my uh, my peers and colleagues. Um, But if I make it, and I even I don't even like to watch the monitors if it's hyper realistic the way they're filming it. It's it's funny. But if I make it, I can sort of remove myself from the the realism of it. But um. Uh, I was going to address something you said a second ago. And Where do you go for reference for this stuff? Oh like, well, you... now nowadays, just you can just Google stuff. For instance, yeah. I just worked on a um a film where I had to do a uh, shotgun blasted head effect, mm-hmm. and you know I just went on. It was a shotgun suicide essentially for this character in the movie, and I just went on Google, you know, and I didn't even have to go past the first half of a page I bet. to find some really, really gnarly stuff. Um, and I'm not a fan of looking at that kind of stuff. And I also worked on a television show which was recreating murder crime scenes, real murder crime scenes. I had to look at real photos of the actual scene with people getting shot in the face, you know, point blank range. So it's not pleasant. challenges like that that come down the pike like mm-hmm. and I, I have a good buddy who's a who's a director and when when the hd transition happened and then again when the 4k transition happened he was like this is gonna fuck up the makeup <laughs> so bad like yeah. this is gonna be such a problem mm. and have you like felt the need to change your practice or or Think differently when you know that things are going to be shot at higher resolution. I think a lot of people sitting in this chair right now with more experience than me working with, you know, the red, the, the all the HD 4K cameras. I mean, I would like to say there's there's certain products that you would want to use. And trust me, the makeup industry has put HD after their products now. Oh, yeah. To really cash Dude, in on the, people's anxiety about yep. it. but. Frankly, I don't really think much has changed. Ultimately, it still comes down to how it looks on screen. Right. And if you have to uh, um, adjust it accordingly. But I, the only thing I've really heard, and it came from a friend of mine who's worked on all the ho- on the Lord of the Rings movies and The Hobbit, is that you really have to punch up the reds and stuff. Um, but, you know, other That's than interesting. that... Yeah, I know, right? It sounds... I wonder, you know, I got to guess about that. Mm. Um Digital backs are now more sensitive than film ever was uh, at the equivalent ISO. You can get a higher dynamic range. You can work in shadow a lot more. There's a lot more value in shadow. And so there are now a lot more compositions that I see on film and grades, like color grades, that are set up with uh, a lot of darker values on screen, occupying more of screen time, more of the screen at once. Mm. And in lighting situations where you're you're using less light, you're using available light, you're, you're uh, what would be previously under lighting a scene, color value does not read to the same degree. Like when mm. things are darker, colors are less saturated. And maybe if you need something like a wound to jump, mm-hmm. it's got to be redder than it was <clears throat> previously. That's just yeah. a guess. But. Well, I think ultimately it does come back to, I know I think you're, you're on the right track. I'm, that sounds, that all rings true for me, but I think ultimately it, it still goes back to knowing and working with the DP. Yeah. There's a lot of makeup artists who don't, really think of and myself included when I first got started to introduce yourself to the DP ask them what they're shooting on even if it means nothing to you which right. it probably won't right. unless you're into cameras and really making sure that there's a open communication because you know not I've very I've had the very rare opportunity where a where a DP lights makeup of mine 
unflatteringly. Right. But it's happened. Yeah. Um, but most DPs would be like, okay, we see an edge there. They're not going to go to the makeup artist and say, can you fix it? They're just going to light it differently. And that's that's great. But also, some of the best makeup artists in the business um, – have been very much collaborating with the DP to make sure that their work looks the greatest and that the effect is pulled off well. And any DP, any good DP is going to want that too for their own. Yeah. You know, because it's kind of like being a chef and like never interacting with the front of house at the exactly, restaurant. It's exactly. just like, I've so, never been out there. I really don't know. Is it nice? <laughs> it's, it's pretty much it. Do I people mean, like it? <laughs> yeah. That's you. You're, you're always going to have to do that. And right. So I, you know, the whole digital Everything changing, I would like to say specifically, oh, yeah, there, there's this and this, but ultimately the most important thing, because you're not going to educate yourself as to like all the new technology in that craft as well. It's just not pra- practical. I mean, you don't, you know, I would like, I'm the kind of person that would want to do that. And right. I do take a lot of photographs, have a lot of camera equipment, and I know how to shoot stuff really well to make it look good. But uh, it does not supersede, the, the, the technology does not supersede the human interaction of it and being able to figure problem solve then and there. You know, I might do a makeup that in the makeup chair looks great in front of the the um Vanity. the lights that yeah. I'm yeah, the lights that I'm using, which are generally tungsten or um what are these really nice lights sometimes that I get to use. Well whatever. But it might look totally different in front of a of a camera. And, sure. And there has to be that separation where you know, okay, this is hit this now. It's like what you shoot versus what you edit. Also, if your bar as a makeup artist isn't a, isn't a already a certain level, it doesn't matter if they're shooting it on <laughs> right. film or digital. So, but know. how about like digital effects makeup? Yeah. Like, is there some of that in your practice now? Do you see that uh, it, it, on your turf? Mm. Uh, do you see yourself using that in some way going forward? Like, I've noticed on your portfolio, mm-hmm. you have uh, pre comps that are CG that are Photoshop. Okay. Essentially, but, Photoshop. But yes, that's absolutely. digital. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, but that's, that's pretty much the rudimentary kind of digital as far as what today many makeup artists consider ridiculously, I might say parenthetically, to infringe on their craft and their work and everything, which right. is just silly. I mean, you know, there's never going to be, there's never going to be, uh, you know, makeup that's obsolete. There's right. just not going to be. But, and I, the reason for that now is because. There are digital makeups that are being done, like Benjamin Button is a great example, that look amazing. Also, Secret Life of Walter Mitty. There's, there's, and I'm t- all about the the blending of the two. Uh, if you're not, you're just going to be like stuck, yep. you know, because there's no way it's going to go backwards now. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is, there are guys now on set, <clears throat> and just in the short time that I've kind of been in the business so far, there are guys now that are on set that are there to represent the post-production DG or CG uh, work that right. may or may not need to be done according to whether your look, whether your work looks good enough or, right. but ultimately it's not your choice as a makeup artist. That makes sense. I mean, I did a makeup on um, unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt on Martin short. I was really lucky to, to oh, do a makeup the, on him. Oh my gosh. The plastic surgeon. Yeah. The plastic that character surgeon. is unbelievable. I know it's so, it's so cool, but you know what? That character is Based on a real person. It is. It is. Who, who yeah. Committed suicide shortly yes, after. Yeah. 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 And my, and the department head, who's a good friend of mine, Ariel Tolkien, um, hired me to come on and I had, I don't know, a few days, maybe five days at the most to make this, the makeup and, and a 30 year old life cast from SNL of Martin Short. You couldn't which, get a new one. No, I Martin's couldn't. Martin's too busy. He was too busy. He's too and- busy watching reruns of Glick. <laughs> Prime time, oh, Jiminy that. Glick. Oh, man, that show I is that. I love un- it, and it's unavailable. You can't get, find it anywhere. Really? I would watch it in a heartbeat. I can't find it Not anywhere. Even on YouTube. I huh? looked extensively. Oh, it's God, nowhere. Well, if yeah. you got to keep me posted. If oh you do my find gosh, it. that's what love this show it. would be if I love had it. half the talent. Oh, Kevin, oh, my God, just do design Glick that interviews. Uh, um, so, so yeah. you had to work on a thirty-year-old life cast. He's he's hasn't aged much. The guy. No, you know, but you know, typically you don't want to use a life cast that's more than several years old of anybody. Sure. Just, yeah, just because, yeah, time and, you know, uh, the ravaging of yeah. uh, <laughs> gravity and all this sort of stuff. But I had to make it. Um, it came out really pretty decent. It I looks mean, awesome. It came out so decent a, on the, set. The character is a plastic surgeon who himself has had yeah. far too much plastic surgery. Exactly. It's exactly. very creepy. He's like, there's actually a similar character played by Rob Lowe in uh, 
behind the candelabra. Oh, I still haven't seen that. I'm yeah, he's a very it. similar character. I wonder if is it a digital makeup or I don't know. You don't know. Yeah. I got to check it out. Yeah. I didn't know that actually. Uh, but so anyway, I did this makeup. It looked really good on set. People were really happy with it. A lot of compliments. I mean, I didn't like it that much because I don't. I very rarely like what I do at all, and that's just a curse of you know being me and mm-hmm. perfectionist and all that shit. But if other people like it, don't you know? Just go with it. That's been a thing for me to learn, and I did. And it was. Let me see. It was a nose tip, a little thing that covered the dimple in his chin, just to smooth him out, really yeah. smooth him out. But no forehead. No, and he seemed to have like a tightness well, around his eyes, though. It, it was, but that makeup worked well on screen, not because the makeup was good, but I think because of what they invested in the post-production side of it. Really? I mean, they must have spent way more on the post uh, to not really fix the makeup. I wouldn't call it fixing the makeup, though I'm sure there were edges around the mouth. Uh, I, because I remember it broke down really quick. We were on a hot set and we shot for like 10, 12 hours. It was, wow. and it breaks down pretty quick, especially around the mouth. And so it was, it was a very nerve wracking day for me because it looked good for the first hour or two maybe, but then like it looked bad. I mean, like so bad. I, I but I was, I felt it more than anybody else. But so basically the they, and I didn't do a forehead because that's kind of a, you really don't want to put a forehead on anybody uh, for a makeup that's not really thick like a creature makeup because it's so hard. It's such an emotive part right, of the face that right. it never wrinkles right. But that'd be great for the character. It would have been. But what they did essentially is they erased all the, the wrinkles in, in, post? His, in post. Oh, yeah, big time. I mean, wow. if you look at that makeup, you pause it. You can tell it's not... It's not... Not in camera. It's not all makeup. It's... Yeah. I mean, I can tell. Yeah. It's very blurred, and I, it's totally effective for what it is. Yeah. Um, but in that instance, if they didn't do that, I mean, it would have... I mean, I think it would have... the effect, the It wouldn't have worked as well. Uh, it would have been... They would have had to shoot it totally different, but they were shooting it, like, tight. Yeah. Even when it was, like, coming off of his mouth, because they knew, oh, we're going to fix this in post. Wow. And so... In that sense, there has to be some overlap in the two departments for that kind of makeup. Right. Or Benjamin Button, for instance, where they sculpted all these makeups, applied these makeups, but also scanned them digitally yes. in order to reductively take, you know, make the cheeks more hollow, make mm. the eyes more, you know. Protruding. Uh, or actually, no, more. Uh, sunken. Sunken. I see. Exactly. I saw a great talk from Ed Ulbrich from Digital Domain, who's, uh, I think at this point, their VP of uh, production, tech, tech, something. I don't know what his title is. One of the founders uh, talking about the process for creating that that effect in Benjamin Button. And uh, really interestingly, at the, the, at the time that they began making that movie, mocap for faces was commonly done with a discrete number of control points. They would actually put dots, yeah. stickers on the face at, sure. at key points points and then do a a capture based on that and they realized that they weren't going to be able to get the quantity of uh, uh, control points the amount of data that they needed and to get the effect that they wanted Mm. through that method now this was right around the time that higher than hd cameras were first starting to become available and so they used uh what might have been at the time a 4k camera i really don't know it was quite a while ago now Mm. um to capture Brad Pitt with blue metallic face paint on, and they used the metal flakes I didn't know in that. the face paint as control points. So they had thousands of them. Wow. Because the camera was high res enough. Mm. So there's this great layup that Ed was showing as part of this talk mm-hmm. that's a grid of the, let's say, 48 Ekman poses. Mm-hmm. So these are the, the most extreme faces that the muscles of your face can make. Mm-hmm. Brad Pitt with his hair up in a top knot, blue sparkly face paint on, what? doing all the Ekman poses, oh. all laid up in a grid. It's an incredible image. Oh, I, I, I was it. thinking, man, they should have sold this. It would have raised more money than the merch for <laughs> Star Wars. It's incredible. Oh. Teeth you know, I, was, <laughs> I actually have this in my notes. I was going to ask you, and maybe this will be the last one that's right on the nose, but yeah. there's a lot of teeth 
Mm. There's a lot of teeth in your portfolio and in the in in the business in general. Mm-hmm. Is that because that's just you know you you look at somebody's mouth and they're talking and it's a it's a place to to reinforce whatever the character is the makeup or is there like something about makeup people where they're like take any opportunity to that's that's a big thing is is what you just said any any opportunity to transform somebody or mm-hmm. something into. A character, yeah, um, and it it really all depends on your actor because a lot of actors and actresses uh, don't want to be unrecognizable. But then you have people that are a dream to make up special makeup effects guys like Gary Oldman, who, right. who wants like total transformation. He always comes to mind. I can't really think of another one who really likes to be in it because, uh, but yeah, teeth and contacts are a really big thing for makeup artists. Um, and contacts are something that almost every makeup artist has to outsource because it's a really long process to be able to get certified and by the FDA and to be able to paint your own lenses, put them in somebody's eye. And wow. ultimately, it's just I, I've been really wanting to do it myself lately, but it's a huge investment of time. And by the time you've done it and money, you're going to want to do just that maybe. So, yeah. But yeah, teeth and contacts can really kind of make or break a makeup. They both figure prominently into the thriller effect. Indeed, indeed. Um, and I have done, I've done more and more teeth. Um, and it's hard. I mean, you know what? I, I saw feel, some braces on your, yeah, your portfolio. I've done, some, interesting. I've done some braces for people. What are those really made simple. out of? It's pretty much just a vacuum form shell, like essentially what you would use to uh, do like teeth whitening or something. Right. Um, uh, even these Invisalign, it looks like an Invisalign, but you, I have a little vacuum form machine just for teeth, mm-hmm. and then I see so somebody you know, lay down. Upside those are down. probably the easiest. Uh, well, I mold some nice teeth and have a plaster positive, then I can make a million of these things. But um, those are really easy to make because it's essentially just a uh, a, a vacuum form shell that, it's a clear that I've tray. Then glued. Yeah, I then order from Orthodontist Supplies. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So sure. those are real braces. Absolutely, real braces. Yeah. Can you fix this? Uh, uh-huh. I got this guy sticking no, out here. No, can't huh? fix that. Can't, you don't. You, you definitely want to see a professional. Keep biting like that. myself. <laughs> <laughs> Bastard. Um, but yeah, I, I like to. I do like to make teeth, but it is a, such a hard process and a huge learning curve. It's a whole different thing of materials. You're talking about putting something in somebody's mouth, right? Um, which you don't really have to get. I mean, you don't have to get certified to, to be able to do, but teeth are really hard because there's a lot of geometry that goes on in teeth to make them look right, even if they're, you know, werewolf teeth. Yeah. There's a lot of translucency in the materials. Oh, yeah. The materials themselves are really fickle and hard to work with. You have to pressure cast them. You have to polish them to a really high degree. Mm. I don't feel like I'm really good yet at making teeth, but I'm... I'm better than a lot of people because I've just made a bunch, and so people come to me a lot to do teeth. But um, yeah, I'm you know I'm in that sense I'm just like any other guy who does what I do. I will jump at any opportunity, even to make a you know one tooth that sticks out or something yeah. that's small because it might be either called for or it might be something that really makes or breaks the makeup. I mean, so many old age makeups you'll see um, maybe because they didn't have a thousand dollars to spend on a pair of contacts that have the the, the the white yeah. arc the white uh, arcus senilis i think it's called around the iris that you can do an amazing sculpture and and prosthetics and perfect paint job but if the eyes aren't old yeah. looking it looks, it looks weird like winona rider and beetlejuice oh yeah no, not beetlejuice uh what was uh, that? Edward Scissorhands. Oh, Edward Scissorhands. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Does not work. Um, I totally forgot about that makeup. Actually, yeah, it's the, she's the narrator in the beginning of the. Yeah, the that's yeah. right. But so yeah, I'll you know even even if it comes to like fingernails or hmm. any little aspect, and the more the actor is interested in it, and you know, for instance, I made a nose for Samuel L. Jackson. I saw that for the for this play, this Broadway play, which almost never has the kind of money for prosthetics that. You know, to spend because it's a new prosthetic every night, even though you have the mold and the, the fee is nominal. Once you've designed, sculpted, made the mold to, to make a duplicate, it's not a, a lot of money, really. But over time, maybe it is. But this nose for me, I liked it because it looked OK on him, but it didn't for me, it didn't like I didn't see the practicality of him doing this makeup for 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes a night, even though that's not too much. 
for such a minor change. Mm. But people love that makeup, and people tell me that all the time. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the wig because the wig is really beautiful, and the you know we colored his brows and made him a, a mustache and everything. But for him, it was super important. He and I, I fully understand that I'm no actor, but like I can fully understand needing something, right? Because that that is really the power, essentially, of what I do, at least for me, is that. I haven't done it yet, though it's just been an ongoing idea to to do makeups on myself because I know the the, the few prosthetics that I have applied to myself, it's it's weird. It's like you can really um, not be yourself mm-hmm. in a way that I fully understand an actor would want to utilize, you know, to really get into something. And so, you know, I was like, wow, I can't believe, I mean, I can believe he likes this nose, but I can't believe production is going to, is going to, but then again, it was Samuel L. Jackson. So, you know, of course they're going to, they're going to want to make him happy. But I was, I was super happy that, that he was pleased with it and that he really wanted it for this performance. Um, But sometimes it's, it's as much for the actor as it is for the, the, uh, you know, I mean, it is essentially it is for the effect. They're right? they're the what is it above or below the line? I can never remember. So, they're they're the ones kind of calling the. I think it depends on whether they get a producer credit. Exactly, <laughs> I think you're right. As a matter of fact, well, I think that's a good one to end on. Um, do All you right. have anything you you want you want to plug? I got for mm. your website. I have A B as in Adam Bailey, yeah. F X as in F X. <laughs> As in the movie FX. Exactly. Studio.blogspot.com. That's A-B-F-X studio.blogspot.com. That's still you? Yeah, that's okay. still me. Yeah. That's woefully in need of, a, of an update. It's a blog spot. And, and as a matter of fact, our it's good timeless. friends over at uh, Dark Igloo have been uh, poking and prodding me for, oh my gosh, the better part of a couple of years to to get me a, a legitimate website. But yeah. for now, it's a placeholder. Let's just call that a placeholder. It's, it's got some compelling pictures it's on got, it. It does. You get, an, a, you get the gist yeah. of, uh, of what I do. Yeah. Indeed. Well, thanks, man. This was fun. Yeah, I hope so. you can use some of this. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to hear all the edits. Well, there you have it. Adam Bailey. It's a delight to talk to. I had a really good time in that interview. I hope you could tell. I really appreciate your listening. Once again, I would like to entice you to visit us at hardwork.party. Give me your feedback. Please, again, subscribe to the show. iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, maybe Spotify someday, Google Play, YouTube. It's up on all of them. Uh, Get us wherever good podcasts are found, as they say. Next week, I talk to Seki Chan, who owns a vertically integrated clothing manufacturing uh, design and retail business, where the production is in Canton province and retail is here in New York City. Uh, she's a fascinating lady. She has a, a, a unique insight into what is a uh, really a global industry, but she has her hands on just about every aspect of it. And uh, I really enjoyed doing that interview. We did that in her studio. All right. As we did last episode, and as I hope to do every episode until it's not interesting anymore, I want to hit you with a little Wikipedia arcana. This is a Wikipedia entry that shattered my mind that I hope has a similar effect on you. This one, chirality, broadly refers to the asymmetry of things, right? But in in this particular case, we're talking about chirality as it applies to organic chemistry. So organic chemicals, uh, because of the uh, asymmetry of, uh, I believe, carbon groups, can can be asymmetrical with the exact same formula. So you could have a left-handed version and a right-handed version. So just like your hands, left and right hand, pretty much the same plan, but they don't superimpose in any way that makes them identical, right? They're asymmetrical, they're chiral. You can have the same thing with organic chemicals. Uh, 
For whatever reason, despite the fact that the chemistry that produces these organic chemicals in, 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 in an abstract outside of a biological context should produce them in equal measure, in our bodies, we almost exclusively only use one or the other, even though the formula is exactly the same. The example that I might give is, uh, is in terms of amino acids, right? That your body almost exclusively uses the L aminos, even though the D aminos could be present, could be used, but they actually have completely different uh, properties in the context of biological chemistry. Same thing with, with sugars, with uh, with complex carbohydrates. We only use the Ds, we don't use the Ls. Mm, there are theories as to why, we don't know why exactly. But to give you some examples of how bizarre and, and kind of strange this is, uh, thalidomide famously was a motion sickness drug uh, or morning sickness drug that was given to pregnant women. One version of thalidomide was fine, but when they produced it, uh, they produced it in equal measure, so they were actually distributing a, a mixture of the left-handed and right-handed uh, enantiomers, they're called, of this chemical. Uh, one of them caused birth, de birth defects. One of them was toxic. The other one was the actual chemical that they were trying to distribute. Another one that, that might blow your mind, and I love this anecdote, there's an amino called carvone. Carvone. One of them, the, the S-carvone, when you taste it, when you smell it, is the, responsible for the scent for the flavor of caraway, of rye seeds. The R-carvone, the opposite in antiomer, same formula, just mirrored, is responsible for the smell and for the flavor of spearmint. What? Rye and spearmint are the same chemical. <laughs> I hope that did it for you. Quite sadly, it is that time again. I'm contractually obligated to say that our theme music is by the great Breakmaster Cylinder. I'm not obligated, but nonetheless elect to say that Breakmaster Cylinder is objectively tremendous. Tune in next week. Thank you for listening.